Today's reading comes from Mark chapter 4, verse 1 to 20. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered away because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let, him, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the, of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good to be with you this morning. Happy Spring Day. Uh, the good news this spring day that's appropriate to spring day is uh, Norman and Grace Phillips uh, had a baby this week. Joshua arrived, and so uh, if, you, if you bump into them or if you uh, have their contact details, uh, give them your congratulations. Um, and in other news, also good spring day news, uh, there is a fellowship lunch after the service. That means everyone's invited to lunch. There's food for everyone, uh, and there's a friend for everyone too, and we're going to talk a little bit briefly about some plans for the hall. So please come along, share fellowship, have a good time together, and hear more about that. Uh, if we've not met before, my name is Nick. If, we're, if you are new, welcome. We love it when new people come. We're very glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it's my job to preach to us this morning. We're carrying on our series called The Gods of Corruption, uh, Uprooting the Idols of the Heart. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 calls us to do the following. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Uh, so we're going after the idols of our hearts, uh, hard this morning, and we have been the past few weeks. There's no subtle maneuvering, no outflanking. It's a full front attack. We're bashing down the front door to see what happens. Um, it's about as subtle as a Springbok mall, uh, but that's what we're up to this morning. And we're talking this morning about the idol called escape. Escape, and with particular reference to the way we use our communication technologies, uh, that is cell phones and TVs and video games, and we could apply it to many other things too, to escape whatever we are escaping. Um, 
Let me just say that there's lots of good about all of those things. There's plenty of good. In fact, in preparing the sermon, I used a cell phone. I used a laptop. I even used AI. Look, clever me. All of that uh, streamlined my preparation and made, made everything better and, and uh, more helpful. So I'm not saying everything there is to say about those things. Uh, there's lots more we could say. We're particularly focusing on the way in which that idol of the heart called escape latches onto these technologies and uh, finds a certain way of living with them. I wonder how many of us could honestly say we're quite happy with the relationship we have with our TVs and our cell phones. You know, we've got the balance right, and um, we're never upset by the way we use them. Uh, We never feel like we've wasted time. I don't think that's any of us. Um, So, we need this morning. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we ask this morning that you would help us as we confront what's a real issue in our everyday lives. Uh, We pray that we'd be called to something so much better and more meaningful and more fruitful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a famous experiment in the social sciences. It's called the invisible gorilla. Have you heard of it or seen it before? Uh, uh, A scientist puts a a group of participants in front of a screen. And on the screen, uh, a video plays. And the the task for the participants is count how many times the team dressed in white passes the basketball. So there's a team dressed in white and there's a team dressed in black, each of them passing a basketball to one another. And the job is pay attention, count how many times the white team, the team dressed in white passes the basketball. And so the participants view the video, counting the passes, and then at the end of the, at the, end of the video, at the end of the experiment, the, the scientist asks, okay, how many passes did the team dressed in white complete? And uh, the team, normally, normally most participants get it right. I think the answer is 15, 14 or 15, and mostly people get that right. It's not so difficult to count to 14 or 15. Uh, and then the question comes, who saw the gorilla? <laughs> and now about 50% of the people watching this video don't know what on earth is being spoken about. So they rewind the video. This is in the days of VHS, 1999. They rewind the video and play it again. And there, sure enough, a a person dressed in a big gorilla outfit, clear as day. You You can see the gorilla outfit, easy as you like, walks across the stage, uh, right in between all the basketball players, beats his chest once, twice, three times, walks off the stage. Nine seconds the gorilla spends on the stage, but only about half of the participants even notice that the gorilla is there. And it's not like there's some people who just are seers, they notice things, and other people who just aren't seers, they don't notice things. It's apparently quite random. We are just not that attentive. We only have a limited amount of attention, and there's only so much attention we can give. And so we don't notice the gorilla crossing the screen. We are both able to give laser-like focus and count the number of passes. And at the same time, uh, we are inattentive. We can be very distracted, very switched off. Uh, We can have that distant, glossy look in our eyes. Uh, Yeah, I'm quite famous for that in my family, actually. We can miss what really matters. So let's talk about missing what really matters. You read that we read the parable. It's an interesting parable to talk about technology because it's like about farming and stuff. It's about as agrarian and old-fashioned as you get. But anyway, you read the parable. Jesus is speaking in the parable about his gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And more specifically, he's explaining why it is that this gospel is rejected. In fact, More specifically than that, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, there are a whole lot of times Jesus and his gospel of the kingdom get rejected, and now he's explaining why that happens. Look in verse 11. He told them, now he's speaking not to the group he told the parable to, but a specific group within that, his disciples. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, 
But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. The secret of the kingdom has been given to you. That's interesting. So there's something about Jesus' message. There's something about the kingdom of God that can be described as secret. There's something mysterious about it or hidden. It's not common sense. There's something enigmatic about it. It's actually, it's quite subversive. And it's, it's, it's not self-evident and apparent. Jesus has to give you the secret of the kingdom of God. It doesn't quite walk in front of you like a big gorilla beating his chest. In fact, I was reading this parable in Matthew chapter 13 last night. And what I, what I found was around this parable are a whole lot of parables in which Jesus speaks about the kingdom being hidden. It's like leaven being hidden in the flower, etc., uh, etc. Et you see, there's something enigmatic or mysterious or hidden about the kingdom. Look at verse 12. So that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. It is quite possible, apparently, to hear and be aware of the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, to be hearing but not understanding, seeing but not perceiving. In fact, that paragraph describes pretty well half the husbands in our church when they switch the TV on. You know what I mean? Doesn't matter what you tell us, we're hearing but not understanding. Distracted, we're somewhere else. Yeah, so Jesus gives this gift to his disciples. It's a secret. It's secretive or mysterious, enigmatic. It's subversive, not self-evident. And all of that stuff means it requires attention. It requires our attention. We must look for it and look at it. We must give the kingdom of God our time, our eyes, our attention. It must be engaged it's easy to disengage from it because it's intangible, but it must be engaged. We must engage God and His gospel. We must engage the people to whom God has called us and the work to which God has called us and the problems to which God has called us. We must give it our attention and our eyes and our hearts and our times. The danger of our distraction is that we miss out on what really matters. And partly because what really matters is a bit hidden. It's not so obvious. Let me talk about the dangers. I want to, I want to narrow, in on, uh, narrow in, I should say, narrow in on three, three pieces of technology that, um, that carry some dangers. There are lots of good things about them too. Okay, and the first is the TV screen. Uh, we all have one, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you for all raising your hands. I saw them. But I know you all have one. The, the amazing power... Okay, and under TV screen, I'm talking about the all-day-long news. I'm talking about Netflix. I'm talking about multi-choice and DSTV, Disney+, Plus, all, all that stuff, watching different types of TV. The amazing power of the TV screen is that it can take you out of your life and put you in a new story, and it only takes about five minutes. It's a great storyteller. Whatever, whatever narrative you're living, what, whatever you understand yourself to be part of in the day-to-day, -day, sit in front of a TV for five minutes, and there's a new story, and you're quite immersed in it. The danger, of course, is we can amuse and entertain ourselves out of our anxieties, You've observed this. It's not actually that our anxieties are cured. It's just that they're kept at arm's length or paused for a little while while the TV's on. Um, during lockdown, I noticed, I think it was during lockdown, I noticed something new happening on my Netflix account. Netflix is my streaming service of choice. And I noticed a new thing happen. Have you noticed this? That you don't have to choose the next program on Netflix. It just plays it for you. You've no, this happens to you as well. Yes, good. Um, well, not good, but I'm glad I'm not the only one. I thought they might be picking on me. And when you get near the end of a season, they tell you how many episodes to go till the end of the season. You've noticed that. You know what all of that's about? It's about keeping your attention for as long as possible. 
that limited thing that we only have so much of, that we're so easily distracted, wants your attention. There is a, a desire for your attention that is totalitarian. I don't mean there's some government out there out to get you. I mean all of your attention is wanted, and that's a danger. The storytelling TV screen. Next, the cell phone. <laughs> okay, can we do this one interactively? If you've got your cell phone accessible, just take it out quickly, please. It would help me a great deal. I see a few people rummaging in their things. Thank you. Now, I want you to unlock your cell phone for me, please. And if you have more, than, if you have any notifications currently on your cell phone, if you know what I'm talking about, and you have a notification, just raise your hand. Good. If you have more than five, keep your hand raised. Good. If you have more than ten, keep your hand raised. If you have like so many that you don't know how many you have, it's just too many, keep your hand raised. Yeah, yep. <laughs> some of you are helping others keep your hand, their hands raised. Yeah, I know what it's like. Okay, so the cell phone is the nonstop ping, the great intruder. That thing is always giving us a good reason to look at it, always interrupting our lives. Um, I read a, a, an American study this week of college students. Now, I know you think college students are the worst on their cell phones, but they're not. The worst are old people. <gasps> I can't believe I just said that. <clears throat> anyway, I read a study of college students. Uh, the average American college student unlocks their cell phone. That means what you've just done, you know, put in the code and open it up. 81,500 times a year. I did some very basic maths, <laughs> which I'm not good at, but take my word from it. I think I got it right. That's about once every 10 minutes of waking hours. I don't know, some of us might actually not think that's not that much. Some of us might be shocked by how much that is. But the point is, your cell phone is always giving you a reason to look at it and distracting you. It's the great intruder. Okay, the third thing I want to talk about is video games. Uh, so, so there's lots, again, that's good and, and, and that can be appreciated. Uh, video games can be studied like art, and they are often very artistic. The danger is they're so immersive. They're so immersive. They give you an opportunity to participate in a compelling story. Not just to watch a compelling story, but to be part of the compelling story that's in front of your eyes. Um, Often these stories are quite graphically violent, I believe. Uh, that's the, one of the dangers. Not always, though. I guess video games have the, an ability like nothing else to be a life stopper, to just stop life and ambition and fruitfulness. You know the caricature? Oh, the caricature is a young man who should be fruitful and productive and living his best life, fruitful in the workplace, fruitful in family, fruitful in his church, fruitful wherever, but all he's interested in doing is sitting in his parents' basement and playing video games. That's the caricature. That's not true of every gamer. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, but that's the danger, is that the, 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 the experience is so immersive that you lose all ambition and sense of desire for anything that's not killing fake zombies. What do all of these things have in common? All of them have in common that they are easily abused for the purposes of escape, to get out of our lives and to enter some other kind of life. Um, one Christian author on this subject describes the generation we all live in as distracted on purpose. People who are distracted on purpose. It's a good description. It's what we're like. We walk into telephone poles because our cell phones are in front of us. We're distracted on purpose. <clears throat> so, what does our desire to escape, our distracted on purpose, our desire to escape, what does it actually do? It keeps things away. It keeps things away. Things we don't want to confront. It keeps away God and His gospel. We stop looking at the crowning jewel of our lives, of the universe, of all that God has done. 
We distract ourselves. Uh, Timothy Keller once said, it's easier to tweet than to pray. And that's true. So we don't pray. We tweet. Do you know where he wrote that? I'll give you one guess. Twitter. To pray brings us into the experience of the holiness of God and the emptiness of ourselves and our neediness. And it's very fruitful and it's productive and it's worth the time and the effort. But it's difficult. It's life-giving in the gospel, but we'd rather distract ourselves. We keep away God and his gospel. We keep away people, not just any people, the people to whom God has called us. We keep away the people to whom God has called us. Social media, it helps us to make connections. Connections all over the world. But connections are not friends. And it prevents us from making friends. I'll prove it to you. Observe a group of people together. What happens the first time there's an awkward silence? Instagram. Hey? It prevents us from making friends because we're so busy making connections. Uh, scientists sometimes observe that uh, addiction to the stuff we're talking about is a lot like addiction to drugs. And the biggest similarity is antisocial behavior. You see, uh, our technology often keeps us away from the people to whom God has called us. It keeps us away from work, not just any work, the work that God has called us to. We use our screens always as tools for procrastination, and there's a huge psychology and science behind procrastination. But nonetheless, at the, bo at the end of it is a cell phone or a TV or a computer screen or something keeping us away from it. Uh, those of us on Monday nights who've been attending will recognize the phrase that work is worship. Work is worship. We worship God in our work and in the way we do it. Um, well, our cell phones, etc., keep us away from the work that is worship. And they keep us away from resting from work. There's no such thing as rest uh, when you're so connected and contactable as we all are. Okay, so it keeps the work God has called us to away. It keeps our problems away. Not just any problems, the problems God has called us to. You see, it doesn't actually solve any problem or alleviate any anxiety in any real way. It just shuts them up, shuts them away for a while. The problem with that is that our problems, our anxieties, our hardships, our sufferings are actually meant to teach us something. Can you believe, I'm going to say something that will shock us, God sends them our way for our good. And uh, we distract ourselves from them, and we learn nothing. To refuse to experience what God has called us to experience is to refuse to learn what God has called us to learn. I hope that brings us some perspective. Uh, some perspective to what is at stake. Each one of those headings, each and every single one, God and His gospel, the people God's called us to, the work God's called us to, the problems God has called us to, each one is worth fighting against distraction. Each one by itself. And taken together, taken together, the life God has called us to in the real world with real experiences, there's no way we can afford to give that up to distraction, to escape. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. Uh, so Tony Renker, again, writes, Distraction management is a critical skill for spiritual health, and no less in the digital age. That's true. A 21st century skill for being a spiritually healthy Christian is distraction management. Learning how to live in a healthy way with your TV and your cell phone and your video games. To manage the distraction, to engage in non non-escapist ways. But there's more than just managing distraction. 
There's an idol called escape. There's a thing in the heart that we need to get rid of. We need to uproot our desire to escape from our lives. We must not just stop escaping. We must stop being escapists, you understand. Well, we, have, we believe that God has called us to the good life. The life God has called us to is good. Not always easy. Not always comfortable. Not always happy. But always good and from God. We have to believe that. How else will we, will we fight against the desire to escape? We have to believe that the eternity, not just the life, but the eternity to which God has called us, is a good eternity. Yes, a happy eternity, a joyful, an easy, a God-filled eternity. Not something we want to escape, but something we want to anticipate by the way we live. Uh, let me make three practical comments. Uh, three very practical comments about all of this. The first is, sometimes you need technology to deal with technology. So, there are thousands of online articles, YouTube videos, and apps that will help you in a very practical way to put boundaries about the way you use communication technology. The options are limitless, and you'll find the right ones, and maybe they'll help you a bit. So, have a look out there. Okay, that's number one. Number two, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, find a young person. <laughs> Often the, the elders in the church have the responsibility of discipling the youngsters. Maybe this is a, a way in which the youngsters can be a blessing to the older people in the church. They can actually help you to find the tools that will stop your cell phone from going ping every five minutes and that will help you to set boundaries around the way you use your technology. Thirdly, on the subject of the younger generation, some of us are trying to raise them. Some of us are trying to raise children. So a few thoughts about children and screens. The first is, the first thing to think about is how much they're engaging with screens. But that's just the first thing to think about. The second thing is what they're engaging with on the screen. Because uh, there are some things that are better than others. And the third thing to think about, especially as they grow up, is the way in which they're engaging them. Uh, in other words, we can equip our children with good questions to ask, uh, how to understand the message behind what they're viewing, etc. You understand what I'm saying? Good. They're my three practicalities. Uh, let me bring us to a conclusion. Back to our Bible reading. Remember, Jesus in this parable is explaining Different reasons, different ways in which the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God is rejected. Look at verse 18. It's the third kind of soil, and it's the third way in which it's rejected. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. There's a great danger. All of us who have heard the word and begun to grow in the gospel, that silly distractions, lazinesses, procrastinations, a desire to escape, will in very practical ways choke out the Word of God. Sometimes what's right in front of us and visible and tangible and tactile, the here and now, can distract us so easily from the realities of the kingdom. Jesus' warning is don't let it choke you out. So through the cross of Jesus Christ, God forgives. He has forgiven. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, God renovates us. He revamps us. He makes us new. And He sends us out into the world to go to be fruitful and productive there. For a good life full of purpose. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, God calls us to an eternity called new creation. Let us not drift from that. Let me pray.
Heavenly Father, for all of us, give us fresh eyes to see and ears to hear, eyes to see and perceive, ears to hear and understand. Uh, give us attentiveness to the realities you have called us into. Help us to, to give time to knowing you and your gospel, to knowing the people you have called us to love and the work you have called us to do in love. Father, we pray that we would attend to our souls and to our lives and to eternity. Amen.